This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Welcome. This is Much More on Medicine. I'm your host, Craig Thomas, assisted by engineers uh, Ray and Rich, part of Think Tech Hawaii's live stream uh, series. And joining me today is uh, Dr. Dan Galanis from the State Department of Health and Injury Prevention. Mm -hmm. um, it's wonderful to have you here, Dan. Thanks. Um, Thanks very much for having me. You know, uh, I've known you for a long time because yeah. shortly after you arrived in Hawaii, which I know was more than 20 years ago, uh, we embarked on a crusade down at the <laughs> legislature uh, on some drunk driving legislation, and your data was really helpful then. And then over the years, uh, the next time I saw your name, uh, it was associated with the fact that, sadly, uh, leading cause of death among children between uh, zero and one years is murder. And it uh, took a while to sort that out. It's what data will do for you. Um, and it triggered, honestly, a lot of interventions, which I'm pleased with. And then we collaborated with uh, Ocean Safety on some jellyfish studies where we learned that it doesn't matter much what you put on them, it doesn't work. <laughs> so uh, I've been tremendously appreciative over the years of uh, you applying data to uh, what's hurting people or what helps and what doesn't. So thanks for coming. Thanks, thanks, Craig. Likewise, it's, it's always great. I mean, that's how public health works best is when we collaborate with folks that are sort of on the front lines and, and try to uh, take shape of the problem. Yeah, and you know, there are a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of ways we get into trouble, some of them avoidable, some not, uh, some dramatic, some we, they're sort of part of our uh, regular life. Uh, for example, uh, my theory of what the most dangerous thing you can do at a beach after a shark is sighted is get in your car and drive home. Uh, <laughs> and, but, uh, you know, and certainly in terms of uh, uh, how many people get bumped off, that would certainly be true. Uh, and there are many things like that. Um, yep. Today, I think we're going to talk about uh, <clears throat> things uh, people do to themselves that uh, are likely to cause trouble for themselves and others, sadly. Mm -hmm. And the item in the news and also what is working through the legislature on developing a strategic plan uh, is the opi opioid epidemic, epidemic which mm -hmm. has received a lot of attention nationally and certainly significant attention here. And as a practicing emergency physician, I'm uh, pretty aware of it. Uh -huh. um, so uh, why don't we flash up that uh, graphic, which uh, is honestly kind of busy and confusing, because it's a busy and confusing <laughs> yeah. subject. Um, and uh, my sense is, why don't you tell us where we started, a couple of the items that got us to the peak, and where we are now. Oh, great. Yeah, apologies for the sort of, this is uh, meant to, Looks a lot prettier when you present it in its original PowerPoint, but uh, first honestly, I like it this way, and the oh, reason okay. is nothing's clean and simple. Okay. Uh, no, seriously, I I have a theory of how this started, but uh, it's your slide. Go okay. for it. Well, actually, let me uh, speak to that real quick. Um, this is uh, I have to acknowledge Dr. John Strelzer for sort of putting this timeline or connecting these dots and to where we are today in terms of opioid o overdoses. And basically, um, and the numbers are obscured by these, uh, by these call outs, but back in uh, the mid 90s and the late 90s, uh, there was a, a mindset, I guess you'd say, among physicians that it's time that they start. I'd like to correct you. Okay. I don't think the mindset was among physicians. Okay. I think here it was go. actually among, uh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, we doctors, we want to manage pain. We want our patients to do well, mm -hmm. uh, both uh, clinically, but in terms of comfort. So it wasn't that it was, physicians were against it, mm -hmm. but I don't think we were actually the genesis either. Sure. Uh, um, yeah, perhaps I misspoke. Um, but I would say some of the, the lead agencies in medicine more or less said, issued statements saying we're undervaluing pain or we're we're not uh, seeking out how the patient's doing in regards to their pain. That's well phrased. Okay. And so uh, there was a, what was it called? Uh, the APS statement, uh, namely, we're under treating pain. And then right. this, this became, as it often does, part of sort of a process. So the Joint right. Commission, which I think was called something different back then, mm -hmm. issued a statement. Calling the 
pain is the fifth vital sign, for example, to be routinely uh, Routine, monitored and yes, queried about. obtained on arrival, mm -hmm. uh, recorded on arrival, and, it, and a number was assigned to it, uh, zero to 10. Anybody who's been in the ER is probably familiar with that, or little kids mm -hmm. get to pick frowny, smiley, frowny faces. Um, and on the face of it, all that was reasonable. You want people to be sure. comfortable. Right. Uh, something that was unrecognized <clears throat> at the time, I believe, or I, certainly not by me, was the behind the scenes influence of pharmacy and I'm embarrassed to say, uh, medical researchers working for pharmaceutical companies, uh, which basically at the time said, look, we're under treating it. These things work great for acute and chronic pain and they're so safe. Mm -hmm. Yes, clearly uh, they had a role to play in, in the dramatic increase in uh, basically consumption of, of opioids over, say, um, early 2000s, up to it began tailing off a little in, uh, I believe, around 2011, 2012. So, and now we see much more cautionary messages coming from medical societies. And right, and it has <clears throat> peaked and is coming down some. Uh, and I've also seen some recent literature that compares our consumption patterns to the rest of the world. And it's staggering. It is, uh, yes. And I think the rest of the world has uh, probably always thought they were only good in short courses for acute pain. Mm -hmm. uh, we got into a whole bunch of other realms, uh, none of which it works. Right, right. So, so now we're seeing, I guess you would say, sort of uh, the pendulum sort of swinging back towards uh, you know, what we want to see is such more, uh, I guess you'd say, less liberal prescribing practices. And, and to be specific, yeah, I think that's a fine general <clears throat> statement. I think specifically what we want to see is them limited to acute situations where the benefit outweighs the risk and both the provider, the prescriber, and the patient are engaged about what the risks are. Me personally, mm -hmm. I think they're generally not good drugs to take. Mm -hmm. um, their benefit is, I think, overrated, and their risks are much higher than was initially appreciated. Um, let's uh, <clears throat> take a look at perhaps uh, some unintended consequence. We've always talked about the unintended consequence of making pain a fifth vital sign. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there's uh, consequences, they may not be avoidable, but they're certainly unintended about the impact of uh, changing the availability of uh, prescription narcotics. So the next slide uh, discusses that. Uh, yeah, and, and you know, essentially with high users at that point, you're dealing with addicts, people with, with addictions who will go into withdrawal within a day or two, I suppose. Depends on the, yes, <coughs> absolutely. It yeah. can be shorter than that. And basically, as you know, there are various formulations. Some are Short-acting, mm -hmm. and incidentally, we're talking about oral here. Um, most of these prescriptions are oral, mm -hmm. uh, essentially. Most, we'll stick with that. Um, and some of them are designed for early onset <clears throat> brief duration, but many of them are designed for less frequent use and longer action. Mm -hmm. Those drugs, your withdrawal doesn't start quite as soon, but mm -hmm. it'll still start, uh, as you said, in a day or two for sure. Right. So. Uh, you know, perhaps a lot of people know folks who, are, who sort of go through this when, you know, at, if the prescribing guideline is limited to, say, a three-day supply, and if you're on day three and there's some glitch in getting a renewal, uh, you know, I've seen where that really affects a person straight away. So, so the point here is that with a person who's addicted uh, to opioids and their prescription supply is more or less curtailed, we do see that sort of dotted yellow line that we've seen in, in the rest of the country, the uh, dramatic increases in heroin-related heroin overdoses. Yeah, so unsurprising. Uh, they're mm -hmm. the same drug, really. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can either get them from your pharmacy <clears throat> or from your dealer. Uh, well, you can get pills either way, but, uh, uh, but heroin is sort of the prototypical opioid, so of course it works. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, uh, this is a bad trend because who knows what they're actually taking. You might be taking True. fentanyl, right. for example. But fentanyl, a very potent opioid, uh, people like it just fine. 
uh, like all opioids, uh, this, it has a bunch of side effects, and its particular side effect is it's really good at stopping breathing. Um, what happened to Prince? It mm -hmm. happens to a lot of people. Um, so um, uh, this is a worrisome trend. Also, if you end up shooting it up, you get at risk for all sorts of infectious diseases and other complications. Uh, so I, this is disturbing. Just for the record, Hawaii has actually sort of lagged the country in opioid abuse in general and particularly in injectable heroin use, which is a good thing to lag in. Yeah, we, in Hawaii, for example, our fatality rates for opioid, for prescription opioids is sort of leveled off. I think we probably peaked around 2010, 2011, whereas it continues to increase for the rest of the country. And as you're saying, uh, for whatever reason, we have relatively less involvement with heroin in Hawaii and more in, in things like ice. So, but even with what sort of uh, limited data we have so far, there does look to be a, an increase in heroin-related overdoses over the last three, four years in, in Honolulu. Yeah, I, yes, I, I know that's what the data shows. Uh, anecdotally, in the EDs, we're seeing more. Um, and it's entirely predictable. I don't think it's... Mm -hmm avoidable. Uh, I think it's a, an unintended but expected consequence is how I would describe it. Yeah, so you'd obviously you'd like to have that sort of intermediary step where, where opioid dependent patients get onto medically assisted treatment, with buprenorphine and, and those sort of regimens yes. to sort of just do the, just not end up in this scenario. And exactly, and we're yeah. going to focus on how uh, there are some options in the strategic plan, mm -hmm. um, but you're pointing out exactly that if someone comes sees me, for example, they're on a chronic opioid, and I deem it inappropriate for them to be on a chronic opioid, because generally mm -hmm. that's inappropriate, um, and I don't want to refill their prescription, I should engage them in treatment options. Absolutely. And uh, yeah. uh, we'll talk about uh, okay. the spectrum of options and and what's contemplated uh, as we get through the rest of it, but uh, yes, that, keep that in mind. Okay. Okay. Um, so the next slide uh, tells us some interesting stories <coughs> about, and so this is a slide relating uh, demographic age mm -hmm. to uh, opioid death risk, and this is the kind of thing you do. What are the correlations between one set of data, people dying, uh, let's say, and uh, something else, like how old they are. Mm -hmm. Right. This is invariably a, a surprising thing to present to, uh, to audiences that the highest risk group for, for fatal opioid poisonings in Hawaii is essentially my demographic, the 50 to 59, or broadening it out, maybe 50 to 65. Um, and in Hawaii, we, we have, where we're kind of off the curve compared to the rest of the nation is we have relatively low rates for younger adults, say 20 to 40-ish. Um, so it's really that sort of, uh, if I can be charitable, that middle age uh, part of the age spectrum, so 50 to 65. So, so let me ask you how many 130-year-old guys you know. I'm just trying to get the middle age thing <laughs> sorted right. out here. Because I'm right. all in favor of being middle aged since I'm 66, but <laughs> yeah, I don't right. think I can sell that anymore. <laughs> I know, right? Let's say AARP eligible. Let's put it that way. There you go. So it's funny. So, and then the other thing to point out is, so the blue it's broken up by gender here, and uh, males generally have higher rates, but um, they're really comparable at a lot of ages to the rates with females, which is which is unusual for a lot of trauma um, related outcomes, and it, it just shows that. There's a fair amount of uh, women who are affected by, by this addiction, this, yeah. this issue. I mean, as you point out, <clears throat> guys are worse. But the female numbers are very real, and the disparity uh, between the genders for some other things is much greater. Uh, yes. in, in favor of females, I should point out. Right. They, they do, they're, they're smarter than us. Let's I wasn't going to say it, but yeah. Can't That's... deny the data, right? <laughs> um, yes, yeah, and in a lot of cases, drowning, homicides, et cetera. Uh, suicides, it's four to one, five to one, male. So, yeah, what's that's what's the ratio for uh, impaired driving uh, fatalities and or conviction? Uh, on that order, it's it's generally eighty percent male. That's what I going thought. off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah. Um, because and we'll 
circle to these themes as we go along. Uh, opioid is the current hot topic. It's uh, definitely deserves to be. And to the extent that uh, uh, the medical profession is a significant player in this problem, and it clearly is, mm -hmm. uh, we got to solve it, and we're culpable. I, I, I'm there. And uh, we'll resume this chain after um, the break. I look okay. forward to more visiting. Great. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king, come banging on your chest. You can beat the world, you can beat the war, you can talk to God, go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock, you can move a mountain, you can break rocks, you can be a master, don't wait for luck, dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. Welcome back. This is your host, Greg Thomas, on Much More on Medicine, and with Dan Galanis, uh, PhD epidemiologist from the State Department of Health. Welcome back. It's nice to see you again. Thanks. Uh, and as we were discussing before the break, uh, clearly the opioid epidemic is the current hot topic, but we shouldn't forget other uh, behaviors that uh, we may be more used to, but which have a big impact. And uh, Let's talk a little bit more about alcohol. There's, uh, it has a deleterious impact on many aspects of health. Um, mm -hmm. It's also interesting because probably more than almost any other uh, sort of uh, pharmaceutical intervention, and it is, uh, uh, it has impact on others. So one rough metric of the impact of uh, uh, alcohol is drunk di driving fatality. Mm -hmm. um, so how do those numbers stack up to the opioid overdose? Uh, it's, it's still a, an issue with us in society, impaired driving. Um, cars are getting safer, trauma system is getting better, but, and, and as a result of probably those things, the number of uh, crash-related fatalities in Hawaii has halved in the last, say, 10, 15 years. But within those who still die from crashes, at least roughly half of them are related to impaired driving. Oftentimes, uh, the other vehicle, you might say. Right. Um, so it's, you know, so we're seeing encouraging trends in overall motor vehicle safety, but the proportion that is related to impaired driving really hasn't changed over time. Which is really disappointing <clears throat> to both of us. Mm -hmm. we, we, we've been working for years in ways that we think like the impact, and so far I'm disappointed to say I don't think it really has. Um, because like most things, prevention is key. Interestingly, uh, as in the opioid uh, situation, our comparable countries around the world have very different approaches. Lower blood alcohol levels to drive, essentially zero. Mm -hmm. um, and some other things too. Uh, lower speed limits, uh, roundabouts instead of stoplights, lots of things. And the net result is the fatality per million miles is extraordinarily different in countries like Sweden or Finland or mm. uh, most of Europe, um, despite the Audubon reputation. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, it's a, it's, I didn't want to just focus on opioids. Um, and in fact, another hot topic, and maybe we should have you come back for this at some stage, is gun violence. Uh, mm -hmm. Hawaii is blessed with a pretty low level, but I think largely due to our, our gun laws, although mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Controversial topic, but yeah, it's the, the correlation between uh, access to uh, firearms and the homicide rate is very high. Anything Absolutely. you'd like it's, to add to that? Well, uh, when you're talking to an epidemiologist, it's, it's undeniable, and 
Uh, this is like cigarettes and cancer, honestly. Uh, and you're right, Hawaii is in, has been for a long time had the lowest rates of firearm-related violence, be it uh, homicide, be it uh, self-inflicted in suicides, for example. Uh, so that's, that's one area where Hawaii is a, a good example of how legislation can help control some of these issues. Yeah, I view it as encouraging. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we'll get more data over time. I think that there actually will be some more firearm safety-related research and we can act in appropriate ways. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get back to the okay. topic of the day. Um, <clears throat> so this is a pretty interesting slide. Uh, it relates the... Uh, per capita consumption by uh, county across the state. Yeah, and this, and I want to point out this is uh, only for two substances, hydrocodone and oxycodone, two pres uh, specific prescribed opio opioids. Uh, this data is from the um, prescription database that's managed by Public Safety Department for Hawaii. And uh, these numbers, looking at over at the right there, uh, for Hawaii County, and Maui County, those, so that means there were 50 dispensed prescriptions for these substances per 100 residents in those counties, which is fairly staggering in a single which, year. Which is very impressive. Um, now, if I understand it right, it doesn't mean that half the people got NARCs. Right, what it exactly. means is... Uh, there, there's very high users, and then there's, of course, exactly. the majority of the population does not have Any. a dispensed yeah. prescription. So that just tells you even the dispor disproportionate consumption among individuals is extremely high users. And the nearly twofold variation by yes. county. Right. Um, so we have lowest consumption here in, in Honolulu or Oahu. Mm -hmm. So uh, that actually leads to the next year slide, which is uh, opioid poisoning rates, not to be conflated with death rates. Uh, you might end up uh, getting some treatment in the field or in the mm -hmm. ED. Uh, Right. But still, it does it by county, and I think, again, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's, it's pretty uh, straight correlation between consumption and risk of overdose, with highest rates being for Hawaii County residents and, and Maui County. And much, exactly. as you said, it's uh, significantly lower for people living on Oahu. Yeah, and uh, just kind of eyeballing it, it looks like about a 60% increase from the lowest to the highest mm -hmm. county, which right. per capita increase, which is a lot. Right. Uh, so all these things uh, lead us to the current state of uh, developing a strategic plan for the state. You want to tell me about this in this sort of overall picture, who's pushing it, uh, who's on board with it, uh, what are the challenges, and then we'll deal with some of the, uh, the individual aspects. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, so this was the, I believe, it's term governor's um, initiative to more or less take on this, this issue because it cuts across a lot of parts of, of the administration in the state. And that was, uh, and the Department of Health is the lead agency, but uh, we really act as, acted as a convener for bringing all these disparate uh, agencies and, and community groups together to work on the strategic plan. Uh, that whole effort really kicked off in uh, last July and thanks to our partners in the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division in, in DOH, uh, we do have a, a draft strategic plan in place uh, in, in very short order, I have to say. That was, I think all that rolled out in, in four or five months' time, which was... Which is near supersonic <laughs> speed for the yes. state. Um. <laughs> thanks for saying <laughs> sorry, that. Sorry, sorry. No, I didn't say <laughs> so, so here we are with this uh, draft strategic plan uh, with seven main components, which are shown on, on this slide here. Why don't we l list the components and mm -hmm. then we'll drill down on, so list and sort of describe, but then we'll drill down on aspects of several of them. Oh, okay. So, oh, great. You're so, on. So what we touched on earlier, treatment access. Uh, it's interesting, you know, I've heard from the, uh, from ADAD, the division that looks after essentially the contracts for substance abuse counselors, um, that they're really, in Hawaii, we're, I think we're kind of used to, um, we're beyond capacity for a given health issue, be it medicine or what have you. But in treatment, there is some, un, as I understand it, some unutilized capacity in the system. So basically, you want to educate patients as well as uh, physicians to sort of 
take advantage of services that might be available around the state. Good. For getting into medical treatment. Ex as, well, 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 yes, I agree completely. Mm -hmm. uh, so the next item? Uh, prescriber education, and uh, particularly in the context of pain management. So that, that kind of goes back to what we kicked off the show with, with um, sort of making a more considered or more uh, guided approach to, dispense, to prescribing these substances to patients to try and avoid some of these, these Exactly, uh, and as, as we discussed, uh, you can have unintended consequences, mm -hmm. and um, I think it's largely how we got into this fix. And right. there will no doubt be consequences, like, say, increased heroin use, right. of dialing it back. Right. Um, the data, data element. Data and evaluation, that's uh, obviously uh, my department with the partners we work with on this plan, and, and they are all across the board. So we're really, um, we're really sort of, uh, our role going forward is to basically support all the other groups in terms of what data they need to plan interventions, evaluate them, and sort of move things forward, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so then that gets to prevention and public education. I know there's some PSAs coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, because my sense is expectations, education, understanding the limitations of uh, an intervention, namely not any good for chronic pain, for example, mm -hmm. and the risks. You can get hooked. Are, are all part of this whole package. Yep. Yeah, and uh, so, you know, it's easy to make PSAs. It's much harder in, uh, in, in, the, in public health to actually get airtime and have that sort of uh, dissemination. But, I mean, this, this can take the form of uh, educating providers to, in turn, uh, counsel their patients. You know, Absolutely. you might have someone in front of you that really is sort of demanding opioid access. Um, well, and... That uh, takes a uh, joint effort, mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Yep. Uh, the other tabs, I'm going to list them in the interest of okay. time. We're going to have to uh, wrap up. But basically, obviously, pharmacies are involved. Uh, the uh, uh, first responders, naloxone administration mm -hmm. are involved. I am definitely all over that. It's a great idea. I think that community and naloxone initiatives are fabulous. Um, and then there's this thing called SBIRT, SBIRT, which I think is a way of identifying providers, identifying people who are likely to turn to heroin if they don't get some help mm -hmm. uh, when you're managing their chronic pain in a new way, or that narcotics are in some way affecting their life. So yep. I think that's fabulous. They yep. take advantage of the resource available. Exactly, yeah. Listen, it's been wonderful having you here today. We'll have you back. There's lots of... Uh, impact of data on health. Um, so I look forward to next time. Great. Thank, Thank you, you all for joining us. Uh, this is Craig Thomas, Much Wanted Medicine.